welcome to this month's programme. I can't begin by saying good evening, as I usually do, because on this occasion, we are not dealing with the sky at night. We are dealing with the sky by day and talking about our own sun, our own particular star. All those stars you see at night time are themselves suns, many of them larger, brighter, and hotter than ours. And a few facts about it. First of all, it's very hot, obviously. The center of the sun, temperature around about 15 million degrees. This day, before I go any further, I want to welcome a very distinguished guest, Professor John Brown, the Astronomer Royal for Scotland. John, welcome to the program. Oh, thanks very much, Patrick. Nice to be here. So, sunspots, John. Well, sunspots are one of the many manifestations of solar weather. I mean, the sun to us looks very bright, very smooth. But if you observe it, as you say, very carefully, you find there are a lot of features there, particularly these dark patches that were known, actually known long before Galileo. The ancient Chinese people saw them through thin cloud and so on. They're not really dark, though. No, they're, well, they're only relatively dark. It's just like if you walk mm. up to somebody's door with a halogen lamp, everything looks dark around it because you're dazzled. And it's because the surrounding sun is 6,000 degrees as compared to the sunspots, which are about 4,000 degrees. Yes. So they're only dark relatively, but they're certainly darker than the, the average of the sun. But what causes them? They are magnetic phenomena, aren't they? Yeah, they, they seem basically to be cooler because they are wrapped up in, in magnetic field, like the magnetic field that comes out of a bar magnet. And the magnetic field somehow insulates them, like winter woolies, insulates the gas in the centre from some of the heat from the surroundings and the, the temperature drops a bit. So they're caused by magnetic fields combined with the fact that the sun is spinning and also because it's very hot in the middle, the gas in it rises up like convection above a radiator, you know, like you see the, the waves in the air above a radiator. So that combination of swirling convection and rotation twists up the magnetic field and you get these dark bundles of magnetic fields. Well, you've got some experiments there, haven't you? Yeah, if you'd like to just hold that for me. I will, yeah, thank you. We've got some compasses here, and these are, you know, like your iron filings. So here the, the, the sun's relatively yeah. uniform, but as we'll see in a moment, the, the sun's activity, sunspots, varies over time. So as the sun gets more and more active, as it's starting to do this year, actually, after a quiet period, you get this concentration of magnetic fields. And this one here that I'm jiggling, might, that might be a sunspot, for example. Yeah. Over here, into sunspot regions. And you get these magnetic fuel lines that kind of connect across from one part of the sun to the other. So this is called solar activity and, and it, it uh, exhibits an activity cycle uh, about uh, every 11 years or so. Now the sunspot cycle does affect our climate and our weather, no question about that. It does. There was a great lack of sunspots for a couple of years and there was a lot of talk, oh, is the sun changing and so on. And I even had people asking, could the lack of sunspots have caused all this snow in Britain? And I'm afraid the sun is not that choosy. But Overall, it does seem there is a connection to some extent because we had this very prolonged modern minimum period a few centuries ago. 1645, 1715, the so, Thames froze yeah. every year. Yeah, so you've got less sunspots and much colder weather. So it there does. is some rather yeah. subtle connection. And of course, we know the sun is very large and very hot. And mm. People think it's burning, but it's not. that's not the correct answer. It's not burning like a conventional cold fire. The only process we know and we're sure is nuclear fusion. What actually enables the sun to shine the way it does isn't the fusion itself, it's the, 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 the great mass of the sun. Gravity makes the sun shrink and as it shrinks the pressure inside goes up until the pressure and the temperature are so high that it stops shrinking. Now if that process went on and on and on the sun even then would only last about 10 million years. But because the temperature is so high, uh, nuclear fusion starts in the middle, like a hydrogen bomb process, and that's a much more powerful source of energy. And that's enough to keep the sun shining for 10 billion years. We've only had about 4.5, 5 billion so far. So it's got a long way to run. We have a long way to go yet. We have. John, thank you very much. Earlier today, the sun was out, I'd be to say. Pete and Paul were in my garden, showing just how to observe the sun quite safely. 
Hi, Paul. How's it going? It's not too bad. It's a beautiful day, isn't it? Well, it's Selzy, isn't yeah, it? It's always clear weather. here. I'm projecting the sun the old-fashioned way. Now, I <laughs> saw you lining that up in the correct way. Yeah, well, I wouldn't dream of putting my retina to the viewfinder. No, so absolutely not. That's very dangerous. Instant blindness yeah. will result. So you're, what you're doing is you're twisting the telescope round so you get the shadow of the tube to a minimum size. That's right, so it yeah. looks like a circle that's on the right. ground. That's right. And once I know that's in position, then the sun will be, as it is now, uh, projected onto the piece of paper. And I'm glad to see you've capped the finder as well. Yeah, that's yeah. a common error, actually when observing the sun, because if you forget to cap the finder, that's a little telescope yep. that can send the heat through it and you can, can have I've trouble with that. I've myself before doing yeah. it, so I'm very careful with that. Mm. And uh, then I've got one of these uh, observing blanks. Just put the sun in the centre like this. OK, look, yeah. Oh, look at those lovely sunspots there in the corner. And what I would do then, so I'm just going to get in focus, is then note the positions of the sunspots and draw them in. Of course, uh, I wouldn't dream of uh, using any other telescope but a refractor because the heat... A, a reflector is an extremely dangerous telescope yeah. to use for solar observing because of the secondary mirror. The heat from the primary heats the secondary mirror yeah. and that can actually cause it to explode. Oh, and then dear. you get shards of glass yeah, falling down onto the primary. So it's always a refractor, really, for solar work. And a reminder to people never to look through the eyepiece. And I have a little demonstration here, look. Here we are. I imagine this is the retina. Oh dear, yes, I know what's going to happen yeah. with this. And you straight in <laughs> and off it goes, you see, burning away Straight quite away, nicely. Right you can imagine if this was your retina, yeah. the damage would be instant and permanent. Yeah. Now put it down before you start a fire. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we have a look at your setup? Because yours is much more complicated than mine. Well, I'm looking at the sun in a completely different light. What you've got there is a white light setup. So you're yep. looking at the sun in all the wavelengths of light, visible light. Yeah, it does, light, it does rather limit you, actually. It this does. Is, you've got a mar mar marvellous setup there. What's this telescope you've Okay, got? well, this is a standard nighttime telescope right. adapted for solar viewing. So what we do is take a, a filter, a hydrogen alpha filter, which fits on the front, and then there's a matching, what's called a blocking filter at the back, so they work as a pair. I see. And when you look at the sun um, through this filter, you're, you're narrowing the wavelength of light to a very, very narrow window, right. and you're looking at basically the burning, glowing hydrogen just above the sun's and nothing visible else. surface. Everything else is cut out. That's right. Right. So you're not looking at the sun's surface. I mean, the, the surface is called the photosphere, the sphere yeah. of light. Yeah. And that's what you'd see if you put on a pair of eclipse glasses and looked at the sun, that yeah. disc, that's the visible surface. When you look at it through one of these filters, you're looking at a layer of hydrogen above the surface, which forms what's called the chromosphere, the sphere right. of colour. And um, that's, that's about the same thickness as the Earth. And what layer. sort of things would we see there? Would, would the sunspots show up? The, the sunspots take on a completely different character when you look at them through one of these filters. You actually begin to see the magnetic influence around the sunspot. So it's a bit like um, having a piece of paper on a bar magnet, sprinkling with iron filings. Yeah. So you're, you're starting to see um, these magnetic fibrils around it, which trace oh, out the word, magnetic yes. field lines. So can you see the structure around Yeah, it? look at this. In fact, the sunspots themselves actually can become less distinct because this layer of chromosphere above it actually blankets the sunspots. So the, the, the sunspots are lower down and you've got this hot That's gas right. and plasma over the yeah. top. And it is constant. You get the image; it's constantly changing and distorting and evolving. It changes very, very rapidly. But the the really exciting thing for me, looking through a filter like this, is what happens on the edge of the sun. Oh, because the prominences! If, if yeah. I, if I move Have we got it quickly any? across there, you can just about see. Actually, it's quite easy to see. There are some very nice big prominences. You see that? Yes. It's now basically this is Look at this that. is hydrogen plasma which has been thrown up off the sun and is mm. held in a it, mm. like a beautiful magnetic sculpture. So it's just hanging there, this huge cloud well, of hydrogen plasma. Of <laughs> it is. And um, when they're on the edge of the sun like this, you see them against the darkness of space beyond. And you can just see how accurate and how dynamic and wonderful it is. It's very addictive, isn't it, solar astronomy? Yeah, I could well, think. actually, one of the big questions <laughs> that comes up with a filter, filters like this aren't cheap, I have to say. You can no, get, you can get a the little one, which is about £500, but if you get a, a fairly big one like this, you're talking several thousands oh, of pounds. Right, and people say, is it worth it? Is it worth investing in a piece of equipment which is just going to be looking at one object? And the answer is a resounding yeah, yes, because yes, yes. it's always different. Because every you can day. do real science with this, can't you? Can you can do absolute real science, yeah. It's, it's wonderful stuff. It's a beautiful star to look at as well. Those images are simply amazing. And they show what we can learn from ground-based observations. But remember, we are here under the atmosphere and there's a great deal that we can't see. To get the best views, we've got to go above the atmosphere, and that means using spacecraft. And at the moment, a whole armada of spacecraft are busy studying the sun. At this stage, welcome to our second distinguished guest, Dr. Chris Davis from 
Rutherford Apple of the Monterey. Welcome back to the Sky at Night Quiz. Thank you, Patrick. Now, you're deep in the sun with the sun in all its aspects. Um, what's your in particular immediate line of research? Well, I'm the project scientist for the heliospheric images on the Stereo mission, which is an enormous job title. But uh, effectively, the UK have built some cameras on the side of one of NASA's missions. And we're looking back between the sun and the Earth to look at the solar wind that's coming towards the Earth. And they've been drifting away ever since. And they're now almost on opposite sides of the sun. So for the very first time, we should be able to actually image the entire solar disk. So there are other complementary missions such as the SOHO mission which was launched in 1995. That's been going a long time now. It has. A great deal. As a consequence of its longevity, it's been running now for longer than the, uh, the, the solar cycle. So it's been up since 95. We've got a, a very long and continuous sequence of data from the Sun that's very, very valuable. And uh, it's telling us all kinds of things about the Sun. The great thing about observing the sun from space is you can get above the Earth's atmosphere. Yes. And as a consequence, you can see things in wavelengths of light that would be absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere otherwise. And we're very used to talking about temperature in terms of colors. We, you, a blacksmith works metal and he talks about things being red hot or white hot. Yeah. But if you go well beyond that uh, temperature range, you get right up into the gas around the sun, which is at, at a million degrees or so. But not much heat there. Not much heat, no. The gas is very, very thin, but the, the individual particles are actually very, very energized, and they're emitting light at extreme ultraviolet and X-ray wavelengths. And so you need to get above the Earth's atmosphere to see that, because uh, the Earth's atmosphere would otherwise absorb it. What's this telling you about the sun? Well, what it tells us, and the most intriguing thing about the sun, is that the, the sun itself, the surface of the sun, is at around 6,000 degrees, but its atmosphere is at over a million degrees. And that's a really curious thing. And so there's a very complicated uh, sequence of events there, which, which is heating the sun's atmosphere. And we're only just beginning to understand that. And has this altered your general idea of the sun? The thing about uh, stereo that I find astonishing is that we are now able not only to to see the surface of the sun in, in three dimensions and actually witness the, the complicated convolutions of all the material on the surface of the, of the star, but we can actually see and track these mass ejections. Uh, the, the sun can erupt suddenly uh, and throw a billion tons of material into space, traveling at a million miles an hour. And if those arrive at Earth, for example, there can be consequences that we need to be aware of because we're becoming increasingly reliant on spacecraft for all kinds of technology, for mobile phones, for communication. But predicting when these mass ejections are going to occur and what direction they're going in is something we're really only just starting to do. But stereo is giving us a really unique view of that. Now, what about the very latest spacecraft? In no day? Well, Hinode again is another complementary mission. It's got some very high resolution uh, images uh, on board the spacecraft, which are taking uh, amazing uh, images of the of the solar surface in great detail. What about the very latest probe? The latest mission to be launched is the Solar Dynamics Observatory, uh, and we're due to be getting images back from that any time. Uh, this is a really remarkable mission because it's being launched into a geostationary Earth orbit and it's going to have its own dedicated ground station. So when I talked about uh, stereo, for example, these spacecraft are further away from the Earth than the, we are from the Sun. And so it's quite difficult to get information yeah. back from those. You have to have very big radio dishes. With SDO, what we're going to do is park the spacecraft uh, in a geostationary orbit so it's going to be above the same point on Earth all the time. I suppose that will have a fairly long lifetime, will it? The, the nominal lifetime for SDO is five years, yeah. and so that should see us well through the next solar maximum if the, uh, the sun actually starts to get active again. Yeah, looking to the future, an important mission which is uh, in the short list for launch by the European Space Agency is uh, Solar Orbiter, it's called, oh, yes. and it's going to orbit the sun, but it's going to orbit the sun very close to the sun. So instead of building a bigger camera to get higher uh, resolution pictures, you go closer to the sun and look at it. And that's very nice. Uh, it's very difficult because you're so near the sun that the sunlight will make the spacecraft very hot and it's going to have to have white shields on it to protect the instruments. But because it's getting so much more radiation, we can you get more photons, more information, 25 times as much because it's five times closer to the sun. That won't be going for five, ten years from yet, but that's an exciting prospect. Well, we are learning more about the sun all the time. When you think now, how much you found out in the last 50 years, I wonder what the next 50 years mm. will bring. Chris, John, thank you very much.
Okay. Thank you. Well, earlier on, I pointed out that all stars are suns, and every star, every star is a sun. So let's now go and join Pete in the garden and see what other suns are out there. As we head into April, the stars and constellations of spring are on view. And it has to be said that they're actually quite subtle. Now, unlike the more brash stars and constellations that you can see in the winter months and in the summer months, the skies of spring are full of very large constellations with very few bright stars. Now, there are a couple of exceptions to this, and we can find a couple of bright stars in the spring sky by f using our old friend, the plough, or as I prefer to call it, the saucepan. Now, if you look at the saucepan and you follow the natural arc of the handle of the saucepan down, away from the pan, you eventually come to a very bright star, slightly orangey in colour, which is known as Arcturus. Now, that's the brightest star in the constellation of Boertes the Herdsman. Keep that arc going through Arcturus and eventually you'll come to another bright star, this time white in colour, which is known as Spica, and that's the brightest star in the constellation of Virgo the Virgin. If you see these two stars, contrast their colours and you'll see that Arcturus really does look very orange. Now once you've found Spica, if you look above it, you should be able to see a fainter Y-shaped pattern of stars. In the bowl of the Y, there is a slightly brighter star, this time slightly yellowish in hue. Now this isn't a star at all, this is actually the planet Saturn. Saturn, of course, is a planet in our own solar system, so it's much closer to us than any of the other stars. And there are other planets on view in the night sky at the moment, too. If you look to the right, or to the west, if you like, of Saturn, you end up going into another constellation which is known as Leo the Lion. And you can recognise Leo because there is a bright star there with a backward question mark of stars above it, which is known as the Sickle. Keep going in that direction, and you'll eventually come to a faint constellation. It looks like an inverted Y of faint stars, and that's known as Cancer the Crab. And right in the very centre of that faint Y of stars, there is a beautiful open cluster known as the Beehive Cluster, or Messier 44. Now, if you look up and to the right of that at the beginning of April, you should be able to see another bright, orangey-coloured star. And again, this time, it isn't a star, it's a planet. This is the planet Mars. Now, throughout the month, Mars is going to buzz the beehive cluster, if you forgive the phrase, and will move towards it and then off to the left of it. So, if you get any clear nights throughout April, have a pair of binoculars, look at this pairing, and see if you can see the beautiful beehive cluster near to Mars. But there's another exciting thing happening after sunset throughout April in the western part of the sky, in the western twilight. You should be able to see a really bright blazing star. Now this isn't a star at all, this is actually the planet Venus, the brightest of all the planets. Now if you can find Venus, and there's no reason why you shouldn't really, because it is so bright, if you look just to the right of it, you should be able to see another fainter dot, and that's the planet Mercury. Now, it's said that only 1% of the Earth's population has ever seen Mercury, so if you haven't seen it, this is a great time to try, using Venus as a signpost. Now, this pairing continues for about the first couple of weeks of April, but then Mercury starts to get fainter and disappears from view. But before it does, if you go out on the 15th and you've got clear skies in that direction, see if you can see the beautiful, slender, 1% lit crescent moon. This will be just to the right of Mercury, and what a sight that's going to be. Now, the moon moves out of the way on the following days, and then Mercury disappears from view, but there's still one thing left to look for, because Venus then heads up to the beautiful Pleiades, or Seven Sisters Cluster, and over the last week of April, you should be able to see Venus passing beneath this cluster. So there's plenty on view throughout the entire month. Go outside and enjoy it. So, keep washing the skies. Now, don't forget, it's newsletter time. If you want your newsletter, send your stamped addressed envelope to Newsletter 117 at the Sky at Night, BBC Birmingham, the mailbox B11AY. And now until next month, when I come back and talk about the lovely ringed planet Saturn. So until then, good night. There's an extended version of tonight's programme on Wednesday at 8.30 over on BBC Four. 
Next tonight here on BBC One, have a laugh and a moan with Jack Lemon and Walter Matow, the grumpy old men. Nothing.